back from these list master classes to Beethoven because uh, list had, had met Beethoven. So anyway, it's a small world. And uh, so with these late works of Liszt, they become more austere. And, and uh, intentionally not virtuosic. So whereas his, his early style is all about the incredible technique that he had and these um, unbelievably difficult compositions that that he composed and was able to perform and you know apparently Liszt was a perfect sight reader so he could sit down and like sight read the Greek piano concerto uh, and read all the orchestral parts too um, and that he would add things he would play the Chopin etudes and would add you know his own idea to the etudes and. Chopin said, you know, as an aside, I wish he'd leave my etudes alone, you know. But that was just the, you know, his, his personality was huge and uh, he really had a, a big influence. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, lesser musicians who are trying to kind of cash in on that, on that uh, type of, of uh, style. And it led to a lot of um, pretty mediocre, Know, compositions, but uh, you know, List is someone who's very unique and deserves the uh, respect for sure. So, um, some of the works that he wrote, besides transcriptions and symphonic poems, were concert etudes and then lots of character pieces. So, he is someone who was. Um, very well read, so he was pretty much self-educated, you know. But he he uh, he studied a lot, and and he was very prodigious in his you know work ethic, um, and so he wrote works that were inspired by you know Dante, uh, inspired by paintings, by fountains by scenes in Switzerland. He wrote kind of like these works that were called Years of Pilgrimage that had different uh, like postcards from his travels throughout Europe. And so he had the Swiss year, you know, the Italian year, and you would have um, these uh, programmatic works that um, were descriptive pieces. So that was something that was very much a part of his, his style, was the programmatic music. Um, Liszt wrote concertos. Uh, he wrote a couple for the piano that are called, you know, number one, number two. He also wrote works that were for piano and orchestras. Um, so Hungarian Fantasy is, is a work which um, was based on one of his Hungarian rhapsodies. <clears throat> and that type of work, too, was um, a work that Liszt made popular, was the Hungarian style, the gypsy style. And do you see that type of music being really popular in the 19th century? This was very emotional. So the, uh, that gypsy music was associated with you know, violin and um, they apparently would, you know, play their melodies and stare at their, at the audience, trying to pull them into their, their, you know, personality to dominate them with their music. Uh, any rate, um, the Hungarian rhapsodies are important. So we'll just write up here concert etudes. And the one that we're going to listen to is from his set of 12 <coughs> that are called Transcendental Etudes. So they are etudes that the artistic purpose transcends the technical purpose. So it's just a you know, typical concert etude type. These would have programmatic titles, most of them, not all of them, but the majority of these 12 had, had a programmatic title. And the one we're going to listen to is number four, the one that's called Mazeppa.
So, character pieces, etudes, concertos, symphonic poems, transcriptions, um, <coughs> Hungarian rhapsodies. Um, his, his one big epic work that was his most serious composition, I think, for the piano was the Sonata in B minor. In many ways, it's like a tone poem for the piano. It's 30 minutes long. It's a single <coughs> movement work. It kind of has elements of you know slow movement uh, section, um, but it uses thematic transformation. It's a good example of that style. But we can see that thematic transformation element in Mazeppa. Um, there actually are three versions of transcendental etudes, and so the one that we're listening to is the third version. So he made a second version that was so hard nobody could play them except Liszt, and he made a simplified kind of quote simplified version. Uh, of, eh, I shouldn't say simplified. He, he, you know, he improved it. Okay. And uh, so this third version is from 1852. Yeah. And it's based on this, this tale about this, this fellow whose name is Mazeppa, who um, is Hungarian. He, uh, he was caught um, having an affair with a nobleman's wife, and he was sentenced to death. And the means of execution was to be tied uh, without any clothes on behind a wild stallion and to be drugged to death. And so you have this very brutal kind of physical, bumpy, wild stallion ride. And there was a, a poem by Victor Hugo, who was in this artistic circle of uh, musicians and artists in Paris in the 1830s um, that Liszt was friends with. Berlioz was in this circle too, Chopin. Um, and so he, uh, Victor Hugo wrote this poem on Mazeppa. And at the very end of, of the tale, it's one in which um, he survived. And he was found by this uh, nomadic group of um, Cossacks. He, it was a, a tribe. Uh, they took him in. Uh, and then he eventually became their leader. He became the king of this group. So anyway, this is the story of, of Mazeppa. So it has to do with this wild horse ride. It's an etude that is an etude um, that is developing the ability to play double notes. And so the, the uh, texture of this is very thick. It's also one that exploits really fast hand position changes on the keyboard. This is in compound ternary. The outer sections are in D minor, and the middle section shifts to B flat major. Um, and it's still, though, based on one theme. So it's just one theme that's continually recycled and changed as it appears each time. So it makes use of that idea of thematic transformation. So we will talk a little bit more about this on Thursday and listen to this last work, and then we'll do the review for the final on Thursday. Okay.